really heartbreaking story. So basically how it started is I got a call from a woman who was a social worker who worked in the Department of Family Services. And she told me that she had taken four kids out of a home. And what had happened essentially was that they had their two parents, their two parents left them because they owed money to someone in the city and they just left the city. They left the island. Uh, they and left the kids. behind their four kids and their turtle. That's crazy. And so the four kids were taken into care. Um, really sad story. And they were very distraught about their turtle, which had to be left behind at the house. And so the caseworker promised the kids that she would go back and feed the turtle over the next week or so while she figured out where to put it. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I'm speaking with Blaze Fulbrook, who is an animal trainer out of Victoria, BC, and she runs the company Wild Ways Animal Training and Behavior Consulting. Now, in this episode, we discuss her past experience working at the BCSPCA, that's the British Columbia Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Many of you are familiar with SPCAs across the world, and probably there is one in your local hometown or city. Now, we discuss the sort of hypocrisy that comes with many of these sort of humane societies and SPCAs that claim to be against the prevention for animal cruelty, but quite often are really anti-reptile pet. A lot of times these types of organizations really don't think people should be keeping reptiles as pets and by virtue often aren't willing to help or take in pets to surrender or, you know, eventually find them loving homes. Now, Brooke tells us a couple of different stories about those exact experiences where she was trying to bring reptiles into the shelter to, you know, bring them back up to health and have them adopted out. But obviously, the upper management is not interested in that uh, scenario. So this episode really breaks that story down. And she also leaves us with some incredible solutions to help the situation. So if you are in a situation where in your home city, your local shelter isn't accepting reptiles or amphibians, this episode should give you some tools in order to help maybe change that, help them change their policies or, or reach out to them and help them help reptiles, which at the end of the day is all what we're trying to do here. Of course, we don't want animals ending up in shelters, but in many ways, it's unavoidable. Look at the cats and dogs. Everybody loves cats and dogs, but there are many cats and dogs that end up in shelters. That's just the way it is. And if we can find a way to streamline this process for some of these larger SPCAs or humane societies, I think that would be a huge help. And we wrap up this chat with a discussion about Blaze's animal training consulting business, where she actually works with dogs, reptiles, cats, bunnies. It's, you know, she tells us a few stories there, which is quite fascinating as well. Let's jump into the episode. Enjoy. Blaze, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this. I, I think we uh, we were connected through uh, a mutual friend and we, you know, the, the topic of human right or, or, or humane societies and uh, and animal rights, not human rights, is something that always butts up against our hobby. So I think this is kind of a, an interesting story that you have. But but let's talk about your, your history a little bit. Keeping reptiles or just animals in general, has this been a part of you for a long time? Yeah, I've always been an animal lover. I grew up working at a shelter in Costa Rica as a kid. Um, oh, wow. So that's I, amazing. Yeah, yeah. My grandparents ran a shelter down there, so I would go there every other summer and just help out. Um, yeah, so it's been a really big part of my life. It's just been helping animals. Um, and, you know, reptiles in particular have really become a huge interest of mine in the past few years. What what yeah. uh, what got you into reptiles? Because I'm sure even in the rescue in Costa Rica, was probably lots of dogs as well, and cats, like the typical stuff. Definitely right? big dogs and cats place. Um, reptiles, honestly, it would come to my little gecko, Nacho. I have a little crested gecko. His name is Nacho. He is hilarious and just like this funny little character, this weird little gecko who just kind of popped into my life really sporadically. It was kind of an impulse thing where I met him and I was like, I love you. I have to have you in my life. Mm -hmm. And I just like really deep dived into learning about crested geckos, their anatomy, their physiology, their behavior. And he's just been so funny to watch grow. I've had him probably for six years now. And he's just kind of been this really goofy little character where I was really blown away at just how smart he is and how clever he is and just all the little quirky things he does. And yeah, he just got me super into reptiles. That's awesome. Yeah, it always just takes one goofy animal to get you in on it. Yeah. Well, and I think too, like with Cresties, people really think they're not very smart. Like that's always the running joke because they have like one brain cell and it's just yes. bouncing around in there. And like, he's not always the smartest. Like he does make some weird choices where he's like, I'm going to jump into air and just like fall really far. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. what are you doing? 
but he is also quite clever where I've given him little enrichment challenges and he's figured them out and I'm kind of blown away where I'm like, well, he can do this. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. They definitely don't get enough credit. I mean, that, no. that's, that's so true. Yeah. So, so do you keep anything else as well now? Uh, I have four geckos right now and a tortoise for reptiles. Are they all crested geckos? They're all crested geckos. Okay. So you really fell in love with that species. Yeah. Well, I fell in love with it. And then I ended up with a second one that was a rescue who I just couldn't really find a home for. And she had some medical issues. So I took her in and then I got a third one who was supposed to be a foster and then foster failed. And then my partner got one. So we just slowly have been collecting them over the years. Yeah. Well, four is not too many. You, you can not handle too four many for yet. sure. Yeah. 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 So can, let's talk a little bit about your work history. Cause I know you spent some time where you know, mentioned the being in a sanctuary or rescue in Costa Rica. I'd love to actually know a little bit more about that. Do you, do you have any mem- stand-up memories from that experience? Yeah. You know, I mostly worked with dogs there, but there would be the occasional like sloth or like weird other animal that would come in. Um, and it was really eye-opening because it was obviously a shelter that was overrun with animals. There was way more animals than there were people, way more animals than there were kennels for the animals. You know, you would have three or four dogs that don't know each other sharing a kennel. And that's like really stressful for the animal. Um, but also very out of the norm when you look at sheltering in North America, you know, every dog's got their own space. They're not asked to, um, so yeah, it was really interesting because it was just like, there were so many animals in need and it was kind of this constant overwhelming work where you're like, you would get an animal out and you'd have three replace it, you know? So you were never really getting ahead. Yeah. And over the years, what's been really interesting is going back nowadays, the shelter is not nearly as overrun as it was 10 years ago. So what I noticed that's really interesting too, is that like there'll be community dogs that live in the town square and back in the day, those dogs, there'd be tons of them and they'd all just roam loose. Nowadays, a lot of them wear collars and actually have places they go at night where they go home and they have a little family that feeds them and takes care of them. And then they spend the day roaming the village. Oh, okay. So really crazy, really cool to see just how it's changed over the last 10 years. So is that why you think the shelters are less full because people are sort of taking in these dogs on kind of like a nightly basis type thing? More people are stepping up and getting more involved and you know, they have a better kind of understanding of what do dogs need? What do we need to do to care for them? How can we provide them care with the like resources that we have in our current environment? So, yeah, yeah. I think it's definitely been a lot of outreach work and a lot of spay and neuter that has changed kind of the population so much, but it's been really cool to watch. Well, and that's the thing. Like, I remember being in Costa Rica and seeing dogs, like, especially at nighttime, like dogs would just like come out of the trees and then you were kind of like scared because you think, you, you know, they're not they're feral dogs. Like they're, there's no one that owns them. So there's no one going to call yeah. them if they start to like chase you or something. But I mean, that's obviously an issue in a tropical country because these, these animals are able to, you know, th- thrive enough to, to breed where if it's somewhere yeah. like even in Canada where you have a, a, some, a lot more vast, you know, there's colder winters and whatnot, but in Costa Rica, they could probably just continue on almost like wild animals without any issues. Totally. Yeah. They can thrive there quite easily. So whereas like in Canada, if you have a stray dog, it's going to get scooped up by animal control a lot faster. Yeah. Whereas Costa Rica, they don't really have the same animal control like groups. So yeah, it's definitely just totally different. Where in Costa Rica was their shelter? Do you remember? It was in De Heredia, so the Heredia Valley. Okay. Um. Yeah. So kind of outside San Jose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've been to Heredia. Now that now that you say that, it's uh, yeah. like forty minutes or whatever from San Jose or an hour. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. And, and yeah. so when you, then, then obviously that probably piqued your interest in working in shelters and then at home in, in Canada, when did you start working in, in, in shelters? So I probably started at the BCSPCA about 2015, 2016. Okay. Yeah. So BCSPCA for those listening, British Columbia SPCA, what, what is this? It stands for like uh, prevention of animal Society cruelty. Society for or? prevention of cruelty to animals. Society. Okay. And and something I learned from you last time we spoke is the SPCA is not, that's just like a catch-all phrase that people use. Like I thought that was a society that was run and was administered by one like organization across the world. And then you just see the SPCAs pop up in different locations, but really it's just different locations using that acronym. 
Yep. Same with humane society. Um, it's just kind of a phrase that groups will kind of add on to their name. So you'll get like Victoria Humane Society, and they're totally separate from the Vancouver Humane Society. Um, and like SPCA in like in BC, we have the BC SPCA, and they run through the whole province. But you look at the Alberta SPCA, totally unrelated. They're just two different groups. Yeah. Yeah, that's that kind of blew my mind. I, I didn't realize it. It just sounds like such an official acronym. You'd think it would have like a you know a centering govern, governing body, but I guess it doesn't. And so, so what was your role? Did, was your role the same during the entire time you were there, or did it fluctuate? Uh, it did fluctuate a bit. I started as a kennel assistant, uh, which basically just meant I was doing animal care on a day in day out basis. Um, I then moved into a kennel technician position with a focus on animal behavior. And then I was mainly focusing on triaging surrendered animals as well as doing behavior modification for any animals in care. Mm -hmm. So if an animal came in and they had a behavior problem that was going to prevent them from getting adopted, my job would be to resolve that problem so that we could get them adopted. And so so did you have some training in behavior modification before doing that or did you have to kind of learn that on the fly? It was a little bit of both. So While I was a kennel assistant, I had a passion for behavior and I had some really cool mentors who were dog trainers at the time who just kind of showed me everything they knew and really helped me develop my own skills. And so then I went out and got my own certification separately. I got certified through the Certification for Professional Dog Trainers, as well as the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. So once I had those two certifications, I went back and applied for the kennel technician role and then got kind of hired into that role where I then had to learn more stuff on the fly (laughs) because I was like, I had all these certifications, but they were primarily in dogs and cats. And so then I was moving into like training rabbits and mice and rats and bear like birds and all these things. So it was a little bit of learning on the road and a little bit of like previous experience. Are those two certifications uh, challenging to achieve or are they more like as long as you apply yourself, you, you can get through it? It depends. Like the, you know, you do have to study quite hard for them. The certification for professional dog trainers, I got their certification for canine behavior consultants, knowledge assessed. And that one was a hard one. Um, The test, I actually took it twice because I failed it the first time. Mm -hmm. And I remember very like clearly sitting with this one dog who I'd been training for about a year. And I was like, I failed this test. Like, what do I do? And I was like looking at this dog and I was like, I guess what you do, I just try again. Yeah. So we tried again and ended up passing the second time. Um, So that was awesome. And then the International Association for Animal Behavior Consultants, their tests are also pretty rigorous. They involve a lot of case studies. So you have to have quite a bit of experience prior to taking the test. Um, but again, like if you just apply yourself and you do a lot of research, I think you can pass them fairly well. Yeah. And I mean, and it, it seems like such a fascinating field to work in because obviously it's going to be dominated by canines, but also as I'm sure we'll get into at some point, you know, that those skills do translate. And even in reptiles, you know, you, you have a business where you work on this. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but you can use those skills to, to train reptiles and to, it's the same fundamentals really. Pretty much like it's learning theory is pretty similar through most species. Um, And I really focus on positive reinforcement training. So I don't do a lot of punishment. And like when I do do punishment, I don't use anything that's going to intimidate the animal, cause fear, cause distress, cause them to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, I really don't want to make an animal feel unsafe. So a lot of my training is really about meeting their environmental needs, meeting their behavioral needs, meeting their emotional needs, and then teaching them skills so that yeah. they can function better in these problem situations. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's kind of nice to see the positive reinforcement, you know, wave that's happened in the last 15. I, I mean, I know there's like th- uh, things to both sides, but if you go back like 20 years, it was just like punishment. That's all. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And the reality is that like that's those old ways of thinking have been debunked pretty heavily in the last 10 years or so. You know, we know we don't need to use prong collars on dogs to train them anymore. You know, we don't need to punish animals by pinning them to the ground to teach them that we're right. You know, mm-hmm. we can make them do the behaviors we want using positive reinforcement by just giving the animal some motivation to do the task. Mm, yeah. And just understanding what motivates that animal. Totally. So what sort of scenarios or situations would you have in, in, in on, our, on our average day at the BC, uh, BC 
SPCA. That's kind of a mouthful. I mean, I'm sure it's a bit of mix of everything. It, it was. Um, every day was totally different, you know, like you have your kind of base setup of what the day is. You know, you come in, you clean your kennels, you get your animals out for walks, you get them trained, you do some behavior modification, you do some enrichment, you get them happy, you do some adoption counseling, you triage some surrenders, you know, you do their medications, all that kind of stuff. But in the mix, you also have, you know, people calling for help and saying, you know, like this bad thing is happening to my pet. What do I do? Or, you know, I've lost my housing. I can no longer care for my pet and I need to drop it off right now. Um, or you come in that one animal you've been working with, you know, doesn't look well and they look really sick and you've got to rush them out to the vet. So like there was a basic setup for how the day was going to look, but every day was super different because you never really know what to expect. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And and so let's talk a little bit how how reptiles kind of fold into the mix here because yeah. uh you know obviously that that was sort of the the premise of what we were going to talk around and you know when you're working in a shelter situation most things are going to be cat and dog that's just the the most popular pets but then yeah. reptiles start to get folded in and just let's just start with your experience with with reptiles coming into the to the shelter yeah so reptiles are one of those animals where you know, you don't see them as frequently as your dogs and cats. And part of that is because most people who have them feel that they can't really go to the shelter for help. Um, and I think that comes from the fact that our shelter and specifically the BCSPCA was very anti-reptile. You know, they were very clear that reptiles weren't good pets and people shouldn't have them. And that was their standpoint, but it kind of was, you know, not functional because we are in this position where reptiles are already pets. We're not here deciding whether they should be or shouldn't be. They already are. So we kind of have to deal with the situation we've been handed. And so a lot of times when reptiles would come in or people would call with them, we were often told to just turn them away, tell them we couldn't help them and they'd have to find someone else. And that unfortunately- That must be a horrible experience to do on the phone. The thing is too, like the people who make the decision are never the people talking to the of person course. in crisis. It's always like our reception team or like one of our staff that happened to answer the phone that has to tell this person who's in crisis, who's trying to get help for their pet. Sorry, we're not going to help you. Mm -hmm. We don't really have a great reason why we're just not going to help you. We're not going to go into it. You're on your own. And unfortunately, we didn't have other resources to give them. There are no reptile rescues really on Vancouver Island that are well established and well known. Like the closest one was in Richmond. So on the mainland and most people who are in crisis with their pet and need to rehome it do not have the financial means to drive to Richmond to rehome their pet. Um, so a lot of times people were just turned away and that was really hard, both for the people as well as for our staff who were, you know, hearing these horrible situations and knowing that we have the resources to help. We just aren't allowed to. Mm -hmm. um, for example, that iguana we talked about, uh, the owner told us very clearly, you know, somebody left this iguana at my house. I don't want it anymore. I can't keep it. And we kind of said, you know, sorry, we can't help you. We don't take iguanas. And their reaction was, all right, I'll put them in the freezer. Yeah. And so then we're kind of talking to them, trying to say, don't put them in the freezer. That's not humane. Like you can't do that. You know, we're going to have a problem. If you do that, we're going to have to follow up with you through our cruelty department. But at the same time, we're telling them we're not going to help them. So they're on their own. And that's really kind of a crappy situation to put that individual in because they're not trying to hurt the animal. They really just don't know any better. They're not educated on reptiles. Right. And so that person ended up releasing the reptile, the iguana in a parking lot where we then had to have someone go capture that iguana and bring it to the shelter. And then what ended up happening was we had to care for the iguana for months. So, right, so you could have avoided the whole escapee situation. And so the iguana, mm -hmm. what was the situation? It was left at their house or it was like a rental or something that was. It was a roommate, I believe, left it there gotcha. when they moved out. And the person, you know, it was a woman who got left with this iguana and it was a big male green iguana who was like fully grown, you know, big guy. And iguanas can be a little temperamental, you know, they're not always the best, <laughs> especially yeah. if you don't have reptile experience and you're just like a random person off the street who now has to deal with this big lizard. And so this woman felt that the best thing was to put it down because she couldn't find anyone who would take it. And she thought that it would be humane to just put it in the freezer because she read that online. Um, we obviously know that that's not humane for reptiles. And she, I think when she heard us saying like, don't put it in the freezer, don't put it in the freezer. She was like, okay, I guess I'll just let it go. Mm -hmm. And that's where it ended up in a parking lot. 
And, and for people who are listening who have never been to Victoria, if it, if it was the summertime, that animal probably could have lived quite a few months outside because it's so warm there and it's kind of, you yeah, know, it's quite humid and whatnot. But eventually, of course, it would die in the winter. Yeah. And I believe this happened in like early spring. So not the best time for an iguana to be outside where the weather's still kind of going back and forth here. Right. So, yeah, it was really a dangerous situation for the iguana to be in. And for us, you know, we missed out on the opportunity to get any background history on the animal. We missed out on the opportunity to get any behavioral information about the animal. We then basically just had this iguana that we had no info on, which made it a lot harder to place that animal because we didn't know if it had behavior problems. We didn't know if it had health problems. We didn't know if it had a good husbandry growing up, mm -hmm. you know? So it really put us in a disadvantage just because we had turned it away initially. And, and so once it's released like at large in the public, is it your is it is it an obligation of the BCSPCA to go collect it, even though you know management wouldn't have wanted it in the first place? But now that it's out in the wild, do you guys have to go get it? Basically, so it depends on where it gets released. Okay. So every town has different jurisdiction for who their animal control is. So, like in Victoria, we have it split between two different agencies, which is the Victoria Animal Control and the CRD Animal Control. And then there's the SPCA. And so depending on what municipality the animal is in dictates which animal control takes responsibility for it. And so each town has different contracts with their animal control. So like in Victoria, you know, you have three of us, but, you know, maybe in Prince George, you have just one. And that might be the SPCA acting as an animal control facility. So it really depends on where the animal's released. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And so you know, once you guys go out and you capture this iguana, I'm sure that was, I'm not sure if you were on that, that call. I wasn't that. actually. Um, it, I think it was a member of the public who actually captured the iguana. Oh, wow. And then brought him in. So, and brought him in. So I don't think we actually had anybody attend the call. I think somebody else just contained it and brought it to us. And then we were like, hey, it's that iguana <laughs> from earlier. Thing, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and then what do you do? Because I, as far as, uh, can you remind me, Reptile bylaws in BC, is that a provincial thing? And and if so, what are some of the rules? It falls under the um, captive alien species permit. So depending on what kind of animal it is dictates whether you need a permit to own it. Um, I can't remember where iguanas fall on the top of my head, um, but I believe lizards, it depends on their size. Okay. Yeah. So, so if you guys were to, let's just say theoretically, you were to find or someone were to bring in or drop off an animal that isn't legal in bc is that is that an automatic euthanasia or pretty much um if the animal is something that we can't adopt out like we can't legally do it then it usually is euthanized okay but in the yeah. iguana scenario it obviously was legal and were you guys yeah, able to wanna... it? yeah so we ended up transferring it to another branch who had it for a few months i'm not really sure where it went after that um, what's interesting is the SPCA has their own like color rating system for animals. So like their green animals are like your dogs, cats, bunnies, whatever your yellow animals are going to be your Guinea pigs and your ferrets and things that are a little bit harder to take care of, but not impossible for the average person. Your orange animals are going to be things like ball pythons, lizards, geckos, um, some birds, and then your red animals are going to be animals that are illegal to own. Okay. So with the orange animals, the requirement that the SPCA has is that they have to be within certain size limits. So like um, one thing I always thought was interesting was like a male ball, ball python is small enough that it fits within the size limit for an orange animal, but a female would fit in the red category. Classic. And so I was like, so silly because it's like they're the same animal. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for orange animals, you have to adopt them out to a approved rescue or sanctuary or a person of advanced experience that has certain qualifications that make them more advanced. So you can't even really move them on to a home relatively easy anyway. No. And so sometimes management would say, just adopt them out like a normal animal, just go forward and adopt them out. And we would, we would adopt them to a person who seemed to have good experience and was, you know, capable of caring for that animal. But there were other times where they'd say, nope, has to go to a sanctuary. And we'd be like, okay, but there are no sanctuaries here. There are no reptile rescues. So what are we supposed to do? Like, And that yeah. would leave us in these kind of big loopholes where we were really stuck trying to find a place to, for this animal to go. 
Well, and, yeah, it's tough. Like f- from your interpretation, was was there any obvious reason why? Because you know, if you have the, I guess to, in their defense, you might say, well, you know, we're more set up for dogs and cats. Less people are going to want reptiles, so we can't really move them along that easily. But at the same time, the premise of those types of societies and organizations are to help animals. And if you refuse to bring on animals that are in the population, then ex- exactly like what you're saying, an animal just gets neglected even more so. Yeah. And what's interesting though, is that when we had reptiles, it was never a challenge to adopt them out. They went so fast. And I would always look at like rabbits because like rabbits come into care. They're there for about six months. You know, it takes forever to adopt out a rabbit. We had rabbits that grew up to be like from babies to two years old before they were adopted. So like those animals would be in care for a long time. And then you'd look at the reptiles, they're in care for about as long as it takes us to quarantine them and make sure they're healthy. And then they'd be out at the door. Yeah, because there's probably just less of them, right? So people, it's, you know, it's a supply demand thing. Totally. Yeah. And people like the reptile community loves reptiles, right? So if they see like, oh my God, the SPCA has a bearded dragon, they're sharing it. They're passing that information along. You know, lots of people are hearing about it and the dragon gets popped like into a home pretty quick. Did you ever have a sense of why management might kind of have such a strong refusal to work with reptiles? I think it was a lot of the way the policies were built in the shelter initially. Um, You know, I looked at the training information on reptiles too that was available to staff. And it was often contradictory, especially towards what the policies were. And when I followed up with the senior management about it, where I was like, hey, a lot of these don't make sense. They told me, oh, yeah, yeah, they're getting changed. Like it's getting modified. But over seven years, I never saw it get modified. Mm. So it was fairly low priority for them. And frankly, like, I think the stance that they have has just always been that reptiles are hard to care for and thus people shouldn't have them. Yeah. Which is, it's kind of like the animal rights mantra or mantra as far as reptiles go, right? They really don't think people should be keeping them. They don't think it's possible to keep them well. They don't think they make good pets, even though, you know, we have tons of evidence to the contrary. You know, a, a little yeah. crested gecko makes a great pet for uh, for a young child if you set them up properly. Uh, exactly. Do you know if, if those sort of policies carry over into other humane societies or uh, SPCAs uh, across the world? Or is this like very specific to the one you worked at? Um, I find it very specific to the one I worked at. But that being said, um, like our mutual friend who introduced us, she sent me a few policies from other shelters that are both negative and positive. So some shelters actually do a great job and really care about reptiles, but a lot of them do turn them away because they find them really challenging. Yeah, which is too bad. And so can you tell us a few more stories about, you know, reptiles coming into the to the shelter? Because I know there's, a, you know, you can remember a few instances. Yeah. So one of my favorites was actually a red-eared slider turtle named Bones. And Bones was kind of like really heartbreaking story. So basically how it started is I got a call from a woman who was a social worker who worked in department of family services. And she told me that she had taken four kids out of a home. And what had happened essentially was that they had their two parents, their two parents left them because they owed money to someone in the city and they just left the city. They left the Island. Uh, they the left kids. behind the four kids and their turtle. That's crazy. And so the four kids were taken into care um, really sad story. And they were very distraught about their turtle, which had to be left behind at the house. And so the caseworker promised the kids that she would go back and feed the turtle over the next week or so while she figured out where to put it. So she went back to feed the turtle and found the house had been destroyed. Somebody had broken in, ransacked the house, just destroyed it. But the turtle was still there. He was still in his 10 gallon aquarium. Uh, however, the water levels were dropping very rapidly. And so She and I talked over the span of a week where I tried to get permission for us to take care of the turtle. And I was repeatedly turned away and told that we needed to turn this woman away and tell her to find somewhere else to take the turtle. And this woman tried really hard. She went to several pet stores in town. They all said, no, we cannot help you. Um, She went to other rescues. They said, no, we can't help you. And she was basically turned back to us. She even went to animal control and they said, because this was an owned pet, we can't help you. And so she, I remember like I was talking with my coworkers about this. We were all really upset and we just kind of were like, man, like this is so unfair. This turtle is going to die if we don't do something. And 
so like the more information I got on the turtle, the more distressing it seemed, you know, the kids hadn't been able to afford to feed the turtle for a long time. So they've been catching bugs outside and feeding them to the turtle. Uh-huh. Um, they were feeding it like those little pellets they sell for beans. They were dropping those into the tank to try to feed the turtle. And they had a kitchen sponge in the filter to try to filter the water. Wow. So it was sad. It was a really hard thing. Like these kids were trying really hard, but they were all under 10 and they had no idea what they were doing naturally. You know, it shows they, you how much a young child can care about a pet though. Like they're actually totally. going to the work and going to like find bugs and like trying to use their intuition yeah. as best as possible to keep them alive. And these kids had like their parents left them and they were so worried about this turtle being left behind. And I was like, man, these kids got left behind. Like, this is so unfair. And so finally there was a day where our management wasn't in the shelter. And I remember saying like, I just can't do this anymore. I cannot emotionally like say no to this turtle anymore. So I called the lady and I said, bring it in. Worst case, I tell them it got left at the door Mm -hmm. and we will deal with it. And so she brought it in a bucket and she brought in some of its water. And she said that there was only four inches of water left in the tank when she went to get it. And so she brought in some of its water. The water was so disgusting that we were like, we can't use it. We need to just move to new tank. The turtle was covered in algae. Like his whole shell was coated in green algae. So we were like brushing him and stuff. And he was just kind of hanging out, you know, very curious about where he was. Um, He was actually really social. Like he didn't really mind being handled, which I thought was really interesting. I guess the kids probably handled him quite a bit. Yeah. And so we set him up with a tank. And I remember this was like, we had like this one day where there was no management. So we were like scrambling. Cause we were like, if we do this right. We set them up perfect. They can't get mad at us. And so I remember staying late at night, um, sealing the inside of an aquarium that was for hamsters. And we were just <laughs> late at night sealing it. And then like water testing it to make sure it could hold water. And then we got in the building and we ran a hose through one of the hallways and through a window. <laughs> we're filling it up, trying to get the water all like, right cycling it and whatnot and we finally get it all set up we get this turtle in there and he's happy as a clam swimming around we get a little dry dock set up a basking platform and we're like okay this is we've been here for you know 14 hours this is good we can leave him overnight and so we left him overnight in the morning i was in a lot of trouble um i was definitely pulled aside and reprimanded for that and so what did they say they just said like what the hell is this turtle doing here yeah, pretty much. They were like, you know, you knew that the turtle wasn't supposed to be here. You blatantly disobeyed orders, you know, and I was like, what was I supposed to do? The turtle was dying. And I was like, I don't want to be responsible for this turtle to die. And I got held back from a training as punishment for that, which was, you know, kind of silly, but was what it was. Um, And so we had the turtle and I remember senior management show up the next day because they were not thrilled about this turtle. And the senior manager came in and he said, that dry dock's not sufficient. You have two hours to fix it or we euthanize the turtle. And I was like, okay, like we will fix this dry dock. So we spent two hours building a new dry dock. We like did suddenly it. this guy knows everything about reptiles or? Yeah, it was like suddenly this guy's a turtle expert. <laughs> <laughs> and like immediately the dry dock was kind of janky. Like we really rigged it out of like platforms for another species. Yeah. Um, so we fixed it. We made it better and the turtle used it and we were like, okay, that's good enough. Um, and the thing that really frustrated me too, was we had a vet that saw reptiles, like that loves reptiles. And they were like, we have no vet. Like, how are we going to do this? And I was like, our usual vet loves reptiles. Like she sees my reptiles all the time. Yeah. So we ended up sending, like we noticed after a few days that there was little pebbles appearing in the bottom of the aquarium. And we were like, that's super weird. Where are these coming from? And it took us a few days to realize that he was pooping them out. So we sent him to the vet and the vet did an x-ray and was like, yeah, he's got a stomach full of gravel because he's been eating gravel from his previous enclosure. Oh. And we were like, oh crap, what are we going to do? Like, is he going to need surgery? Like, is that even something we can do on him? And the vet said, let's give him a laxative. Let's give him a week. Let's see where we go. You know, and if we need to do surgery, we can look at what options there are. And within a week, he had pooped them all out. Um, and we were like, yes, <laughs> like the turtle is surviving. He's thriving. We're doing okay. Um, and this is where we kind of got to that point where we were like, well, where is he going to go? What's the next step with this turtle? And this is where they were kind of um, really strict where they said, oh, he can only go to a sanctuary. And we were like, okay, well, we'll find a sanctuary that wants a turtle. 
but that's much easier said than done. Uh, we happen to be super lucky that somebody called in a cruelty complaint on the butterfly gardens in Victoria. And one of our constables went out and it was really funny because it was for their iguana. And they were like, the iguana only has one eye. <laughs> so the, the person went out and the iguana had glaucoma and had its eye removed by the same vet that saw our turtle. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. So we were like, we know about this. Yeah. Like it's just um, part of him. Yeah. It's just, it's just who he was now. <laughs> um, so we went out there and our constable while she was there was like, yeah, we've got this, this turtle. We don't know what we're going to do with it. And they were like, oh, we would help you, but we have no space on our turtle log in our turtle pond. There's just not enough basking space. And we were like, oh, that sucks. Like, but thank you. And about a week later, they called us back and they said, yep, we installed the second log. We can take him. Aww. And we were like, oh my God, really? Like, this is awesome. And so we basically held him for a quarantine to make sure he was healthy enough and he wasn't going to infect their turtles with something. And then when he was healthy enough, uh, we sent him over there. We got a little video of him running off into the pond and he basically like, they set him down and he just took off and like ran straight into the pond and disappeared with all the other turtles. And we were like, bye forever bones. <laughs> That's so cool it was, though. It was super cool. And like he he lives in a big indoor garden. So he gets to be a turtle. Like he doesn't have a tiny enclosure. You know, he gets to go in the pond. He gets to go in the bushes. He gets to go wherever he wants. Um, there's lots of room to swim around. You know, there's a waterfall. Like it's a super cool spot for a turtle. And he gets to spend the rest of his life there. And that's awesome for this turtle that came from like a 10 gallon aquarium with a like kitchen sponge for a filter. Yeah. You know? I just want to take a short break from today's episode to thank each and every one of you for tuning in today. If you would like to show more support for the podcast, you can do that by checking out the show's sponsor, Custom Reptile Habitats. There is an affiliate link in both the YouTube description and the show notes. If you do make a purchase through that link, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. The other way you can show support to the podcast is through the Patreon account. For as little as 75 cents per episode, you will automatically be added to the Discord server so you can communicate and chat with other like-minded keepers. If you do bump yourself up to the $5 a month tier, you'll have early access to the episodes and the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests. Again, I am so grateful for each and every one of you. This podcast is a lot of work and costs me a lot of money each month to run, and any support coming from your end is greatly appreciated. Back to the episode. So if I ever go to Victoria to the Butterfly Gardens, if I'll just pretend at least one of those sliders is, is Bones. Yeah, I know. I've gone there and visited and I'm like, I don't know which one is you, but I know you're here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, that just goes to show you like what can be done. And it's not like that was overly resource intensive. And if you already had, if, if, this, if the shelter was set up to, you know, house reptiles, it probably would have been pretty seamless. You would have like, okay, go grab one of the tanks, fill it up, get a filter running. And then we can yeah. go from there. And there is way less reptiles needing to be rescued than dogs and cats. Yeah. Well, and what was really cool too is like when we got the tank ready, we were like, okay, next we need a filter. And we were like, frick, how are we going to buy a filter if the shelter doesn't want to spend any money on this turtle? Which keep in mind, they spend thousands and thousands on dogs and cats every day. You know, like every day they'll be like, oh, this dog needs a TPLO surgery. And we're going to replace its knee. You know, and they do that, but like, we can't spend any money on this turtle. And so we went to one of the pet stores, Creatures Pet Store in Victoria, which is like a reptile store. So really cool little place. And we told them like, we have this turtle and we need a filter and we don't have any money. And they were like, yep, we'll give you a filter. No problem. Because they had actually been called about this turtle and they wanted to help, but they didn't have the ability to house a turtle. Oh, cool. So they just gave us a filter right out of the box. And we're like, here you go. Like, good luck. It was super nice of them. Well, I think, you know, that that's a good example of the point that you made earlier is that those who are like actually in the reptile hobby, like us and people who are listening to this podcast are so willing to help in totally. any way to at least do something like recommend something. Like, you know, I'll get messages all the time. Like, what, what should we do with this animal? It's been found. And, you know, you, you can't take every animal yourself, but you could at least say, hey, I know this person is looking or, you know, it could go here or here's some supplies, like you're saying. And a lot of the times animals, other than like bizarre situations, like the two you've just shared where animals just yeah. end up getting left, you know, the ones that do uh, are being surrendered are often people who, who are almost not in the hobby in a way, like they've got it on an impulse and now they're kind of yeah. going out of it and they're not part of herpeticulture as, as we are here. And, totally. you know, but herpeticulture is happy to absorb a lot of those animals. Yeah, totally. Like that's totally what it feels like, you know, is a lot of the people who are surrendering reptiles, usually 
don't know how they like didn't get them intentionally. Usually they're from a friend or a neighbor left them behind. Don't really know how to care for them. Aren't really sure what resources are available to them and don't really know where to look for those resources. Mm -hmm. And that's often where they end up going to the shelter is that first point of contact. If we don't have the ability to refer them to people who can help, then we're doing such a disservice to the animal itself. You know, like all the time you get people who would call and say, I've got this gecko. It belonged to my kid. I don't know what kind it is. I don't know what it is. Like, what do I do with it? And, you know, that's a hard situation because we don't know what it is. We don't know if we have the stuff to care for it, but we should at least try. We should at least try to help this animal and be like, okay, well, is it on the ground? Is it climbing the walls? Like, what is it doing? Can you tell me like what color it is, you know, and try to help people figure out what they have so we can help them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is, I, I could kind of understand the like these types of organizations thinking that if they support reptile rescue, then they're kind of supporting people keeping reptiles. But in many ways, you're not really. You're just sort of facilitating that animal to have to 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 not die essentially. Yeah. Like in a lot that every situation that a rescue deals with or a shelter deals with is already in the middle of the story. Like the per- the animal has already been purchased and it's already a pet and now yeah. it has nowhere to go. It's not like you guys are selling and breeding pets or, you know, trying to perpetuate it. It's like, okay, maybe you don't believe that reptiles should be kept, but you could at least, if that's the message is, you know, stopping cruelty to animals, help absorb some of that and and send it to people that actually care about them. You know, the people who stepped up and wanted to adopt usually already kept reptiles, already knew about them, knew about the species they were adopting and already had a proper setup like made up and were ready for that animal. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't the same people who are impulse buying reptiles and then being like, Oh, I don't really know what to do with them. You know, these are very different people who are actually adopting the animal. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly because they're, they're searching for that specific animal. Like, Oh, there's one at the shelter. We could get this one. They're not walking to a pet store and essentially, you know, making an impulse type purchase. So what, what do you think? Because I think the, the sort of sentiment of, not wanting to help reptiles is probably something that is pretty pervasive across all these uh, different animal shelters. W- w- are there solutions here? Because I'm sure people deal with the same situation where they, maybe they or self, themselves are trying to have an animal, uh, you know, if, if they go through a hard time and maybe they're trying to um, relinquish an animal. That's not the term. Uh, what, what's, the, um, what's the term? The word? Right. Where people, yeah, surrender. Surrender. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you know, they're looking to surrender themselves or they're looking to maybe help their local humane society or SPCA other solutions here? I think one of the big solutions, and I think this is a hard one for shelters to wrap their head around too, is that when you bring a reptile into a shelter, you're not setting up in a bioactive, awesome enclosure, right? Like that's Mm -hmm. not where they're going to go because you're only temporarily housing this animal. So it doesn't need to be perfect. It doesn't need to be that awesome home that we're looking for. It needs to be a temporary enclosure where we can monitor their health, almost a hospital setup, you know? where we're maybe using paper towels as substrate so we can see their bowel movements, right? And we're using proper enclosures, proper hiding spaces, proper lighting, all that kind of stuff. Um, But we're not necessarily going above and beyond and buying like little isopods and little things to go live in there with it. You know, we can look for that home that has that bioactive setup and that can be awesome for that animal, but we don't have to provide. It just means we are the temporary quarantine facility where we make sure that animal's healthy and then we move it out into its permanent home. So I think for a lot of shelters, they get hung up on that where they like, they want to do the perfect job to help that animal. And they don't realize that we have this kind of in-between step that we need to do first. And that's where the shelter comes in and is really important. So I think for a lot of shelters, just kind of getting that through their head, we're like, we're not going to make this awesome enclosure for an animal that's going to be here for, you know, two, three weeks. We're going to do an enclosure that is doable, that meets our financial needs and meets the animal's biological needs, you know? Um, and so setting them up where they can thrive, but maybe they're not like, you know, thriving as much as we want them to, where they're like really functioning super well, but where they're functioning at a rate that is healthy and they're going to do okay. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a, bioactive. it very much is a, it's a hospital situation, you know, totally. you know, they are in quarantine because they're coming from a strange place that who knows how they're cared for. Yeah. You don't need to spend $800 on a, a quarantine setup. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think if shelters can kind of wrap their head around, like we are the intermediate step, you know, we're not the final placement. Um, I think that will kind of take down the intimidation factor of taking these animals in, you know, it'll make them less frightening to take on. 
um, and make it a bit more realistic and doable. You know, one thing that really frustrated me about the shelter too, was that like, there was no consistency in what the expectation of care was. And so for the BCSPCA, they don't have a standard of care for every animal. They do for dogs, cats, rabbits, but anything beyond that, you know, it's kind of up to the shelter's individual knowledge And that varies a lot. So, you know, I remember I worked at the Victoria SPCA and we had, you know, Bones came in. We gave him a huge tank to swim in with a dry dock and a basking area. And shortly, like in this year, actually, you know, I went in one day and saw they had two turtles in a 20-gallon tank. These were fully grown gray-eared sliders with no dry dock Mm -hmm. and no option to get out of the water. And I remember going to management and being like, this is totally not okay. Like, this is not a healthy setup for these animals. And they were kind of like, oh, well, we're doing our best. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, but we need to have a standard of care, right? And so I think that's one of the things where if the SPCA wants to start helping reptiles, they need to set a standard of care for the animals for every branch to meet. So that if this branch is going to take in a turtle, they know that this is what the setup needs to look like, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because you can imagine a lot of people there aren't going to be reptile people, so they need to have like at least basic steps. You don't need to overwhelm them, like you said, with an elaborate setup, but just like, yeah. and and you probably could say a snake should be set up this way, a gecko should be set up this way, like a larger lizard this way. You know, you you wouldn't, it could be relatively cookie cutter and pretty broad categories because it doesn't need to be super, you know, species specific. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's where I, like, I actually did write up some care guides while I worked there that were like, here's how to keep a gecko in a shelter. And it not only included like, here's what the housing should look like, but here's what the physical exam should look like. Here's what you're looking for when you check a gecko for health issues, you know, just so that they could do their preliminary checks on the animal. And I gave that over to management and they said, this is great, but we're not really interested in doing this. Yeah. And I was like so bummed because I was like, oh, it's such a great opportunity to like expand our skill set. And they're just not interested. So do you think it really does go back to being afraid of having to spend too much money on them? Is that the main thing? I think that's one of the big things. I think, you know, like I always found it super weird the way that they turned reptiles away because the person who would make the final decision didn't have any reptile experience. And they would base it on the fact that they were like, oh, their shelter doesn't have enough people who are qualified with reptiles. But we would often have a lot of staff that worked with reptiles more than the person making the decision, you know? And so I was like, oh, that doesn't really make sense because you're not even checking in with us to see what our qualifications are. You're just kind of saying no. Yeah. So I think a lot of it does come back to financial issues. You know, they think about lighting that costs a lot. Um and I think also just they don't know enough about them. You know, they're very intimidated by reptiles. Well, and the fact that, you know, you could put a dog in a, a green category and then a crested gecko in an orange category, that, that's a pretty extreme difference. I mean, yeah, there's a, you know, to, to care for a, a, a crested gecko, there's, you need to have a knowledge base. There's a commitment there. But compared to like a high energy dog, for example, that's night and day. I mean, you, yeah. a, a child can care for a, lep- a, a crested gecko or a leopard gecko for that matter. Yeah. But, a, you know, an eight-year-old couldn't take care of a dog by themselves. That would be too much. Yeah. Like, yeah, it totally baffles me at times because like, yeah, like a crested gecko, they're very simple animals to care for. And then dogs, like the more you learn about dogs, the more complex you realize they are and the harder they are to take care of. Like, but we often think of them as starter pets, right? Yeah, totally. And so it's it's very interesting when you think about that, where you're like, some reptiles are actually quite easy, like easier than dogs and cats, but we still categorize them as these very challenging animals. Yeah, yeah. Are there any other solutions that come to the top of your head? I mean, I think the ones that you listed are, are really good. I think that would help, especially if people are working in those environments. I think doing like a shelter example of care guides is a perfect thing to bring to management and say, hey, we could actually absorb some of these animals rather than just letting them die. Totally. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of it too, is going to come down to public pressure. You know, if the BCSPCA feels that the public cares about reptiles and wants them to be treated well, I think that would really change their viewpoint. Right now, I feel like they think that not a lot of people care about reptiles and that we're kind of this lone group of small people when in reality, there's a lot of people who care really passionately about reptiles. Yeah. Well, and it's so... they. 
there's a, an infrastructure behind a, you know an organization like that where well, you know I've had lots of people on the podcast who run reptile rescues or at least I should say have attempted to and quite often when I interview them they're in the thick of it but often a few months later they just have to close up shop because it's just too much and like they're trying yeah. to do all this so in some ways to have more people on that problem is good but also to have a you know professional organization like a humane society or an SPCA is you guys are much quicker at moving the animals in and out. You know, this is you know setting them up, putting them on a website. People are very they under they they know to look there for animals that are trying to be adopted or needing to be adopted rather, and it, it would just help the situation so much more. I think there's always going to be a place for reptile rescues, but quite often they become so overwhelmed so quickly that it doesn't work. Totally. Like I think the SPCA has the advantage that they are already set up. They've been running for such a long time, and people already know to use them as a resource. So they have such an advantage on helping animals that, you know, to say that they're turning away animals is quite surprising. Totally. Yeah. And I guess if you could show that it's actually not going to cost, because I guess at the end of the day, there's a business side to it as well. But like you said, you know, most reptiles aren't going to need some sort of surgery or some, you know, vet medications or things like that. Not like a dog would, you know, you could bring a dog in, it could be thousands and thousands of dollars of overhead just to get that animal to a point where it can be adopted or training for that matter as well, right? Where a reptile, you're not going to need to go through all this training. So I'm sure people could probably prove to those organizations that it's actually not going to cost them much at all just to help these animals, which goes along with their entire brand. Yeah. Which the other thing that I thought was interesting is most of the reptiles are adopted out with a fee wave. So they're not charging for the adoption uh, just because they feel that they don't like they don't know what to charge for a reptile. You know, so you're often like sending out a chameleon for like 20 bucks um, or for free. And so obviously they're going to approved homes. So we know that they're being well taken care of. Uh, but they could recoup some of that cost through their adoption prices, which they really don't do. Yeah, totally. You could easily charge a hundred dollars or whatever, two hundred, whatever it is, and yeah. pretty much offset the, any expense that you may have had. Totally. Yeah, it's an interesting problem. But I mean, to me, I always like have this gut feeling that there's this underlying group that really doesn't want people keeping reptiles because they don't see value in it. And they, they just sort of, sort of examples of that pop up in these scenarios. And I, to me, that's kind of the sense that I get. But like you said, there's a, there's a pressure side as well. Like if you are an organization that claims to be for the protection or prevention of cruelty against animals, uh, you, you should change it to mammals then if yeah. you're not going to look after everything. I always made that joke. I was like, we're the BCSPC mammal. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's really funny because I think it, reptiles are often forgotten as animals. You know, they have the same needs as other animals. They, you know, they need their environment to be right. They need their emotional needs to be met. They mean, need their biological needs to be met. They need their behavioral needs to be met. You know, they have all these needs and we can meet those in captivity. They aren't necessarily going to suffer just because they're in captivity. It's whether they're in the right home or not. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, speaking of enrichment and, and whatnot, we kind of mentioned before that you had, you do some training and behavior work as well. Can, yeah. can we talk a little bit about what you you do, uh, as a, as a profession, you know, you had mentioned the certifications and whatnot, but I think that would be a great way to wrap up to talk about kind of some of the work that you do. Yeah. So I run wild ways, animal training and behavior consulting. Uh, basically I offer training for a variety of animals, including reptiles, uh, for both people in Victoria, as well as virtually in other places, and it can be anything from like, you know, dogs with aggression issues to like snakes that like to strike at people. You know, I do kind of a lot of different stuff and I really enjoy new challenges. So I really like working with reptiles in their training capacity because like they, they're very different. You know, they're not like dogs where you can throw them a few treats and like desensitize them to a scary thing really quickly. You know, they work much slower. So yeah, reptiles have been a big interest of me. So, you know, I'm really enjoying kind of doing more reptile training in my behavior consulting business. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm sure most of it is dogs, of, co- of course, because that's, you know, most yeah. dogs. And that's kind of what you think of when you think of animal training. But uh, are, are there some examples that you can think of of reptiles that you've worked with that you've done some behavior training with? Yeah, I did some training with a snake that came into the SPCA that was quite strikey. Um, and a lot of it came down to like he was you know, starved for a long period of time. So he just had a really active feeding response. So we did some training to get him used to being like handled and moved into another enclosure for feeding. So he kind of knew when feeding time was happening and that sort of thing. Um, I also worked with a tegu 
uh, at another shelter that had some issues around it was overweight, but also it wouldn't go on a scale to save its life. Um, so if you brought out the scale, it would kind of freak out and be like, no, I'm not going on there. I will not be touched. And so it was just a lot of teaching it that it's feeding times happened on the scale, mm. um, which was an interesting challenge because it was quite overweight. So we were really feeding it very small portions, but just getting it to start associating like the scale is a good thing when the scale comes out, snacks come out. So yeah, yeah. doing that kind of thing was really fun. Yeah. I mean, that's a, an interesting challenge with reptiles compared to dogs. I forget if we were talking about this on the podcast or before we started recording, but that was, you know, understanding a dog's motivation is huge, right? You know, some dogs yeah. are very food motivated. Some are play motivated. Some are work motivated. They just like to work, whatever it is. But with, with reptiles, do you find it's mostly food? Like, is that, cause that's, or, or I, found, I mean, like, I guess there's, there could be other examples too. I find food and heat are big motivators for our reptiles. And a lot of it is just like, I find a lot of uh, reptile behavior problems actually stem from like not having their needs met. Mm. So, you know, if their enclosure isn't quite right, their temps aren't quite right. You're going to start to see behavior problems because they're, you know, trying to show you that they're not comfortable. Um, so a lot of like beardies doing glass surfing, you know, and it turns out that their enclosure is too hot and they're trying to get out. Yeah. You know, that's a really quick fix. And a lot of people don't really think of that right away. Like, Oh, this behavior is coming from a biological need. They're like, oh, maybe he really wants to come out because he wants to play. And I'm like, nope, yeah. <laughs> he's too hot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you could interpret it. Yeah, he wants to explore or yeah, he actually is uncomfortable in that environment and and needs to move along. But I, I'm hoping that, you know, more people like yourself actually take on the because it's it's pretty bold as a business to say like yeah you're going to do dogs and cats but also reptiles right like that's kind of yeah. like it would be easier to say i'm just doing dogs because you know what to expect you know how to you can read their behavior a lot easier you could probably have way easier time having success with them but to kind of yeah. like stick your neck out and say i i'm going to do snakes as well cuz yeah. you're going to have to learn on the fly right totally and that's like something i've really enjoyed too like i worked with bunnies for a while as well um like i work with really any animal you bring to me i'm willing to try but I had this bunny who for the longest time would, she was really aggressive, super funny, little bunny. Um, she would attack people when they came in the room and wow. she would, she would run up and she would bite your legs and then scratch at them. And it was really frightening to the point where like she kept getting surrendered and returned to the shelter because she was so mean and people were really like, wow, she's so cute, but you just bring her home and she attacks you all the time. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know what's going on with this little rabbit. It turned out she was blind and deaf. And so she was just really freaked out and didn't really know what was going on. And because she was getting returned so often, she couldn't really get an understanding of what her environment looked like. So we ended up giving her, getting her into a foster home that kept her room exactly the same for like weeks and weeks and weeks, never moved anything. So she could get a lay of the land. And then she was super good at smelling out food. So we started to be like, anytime we come in here, we're going to bring like a little bit of banana with us and be like, you know, here's a tiny piece of banana. Like, don't attack us right away. And then yeah. we'll leave really quick, you know, and doing little things where we could kind of get her comfortable, get her set in her environment and then like associate people with positive things. Mm. And so for her, that was banana. She went crazy for it. So we did a lot of like feeding her and then running away and then feeding her and then running away. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, you never know, right? And you know, you think about some of those examples where that's an animal that could just be put down because people are like, there's just something wrong with this animal. Like it's got a mental problem and it's just going to attack people forever. Well, and we took her to a specialist, a veterinary behaviorist, and they said, you know, you can't medicate her uh, because she's a rabbit and they absorb medication differently. So you can't medicate her behavior problem. You're not going to be able to fix this. Like she's going to have to be put down. And I remember me and the foster were so like, we can't just put this rabbit down because she's so scared. Like, that's just not fair. We need to try harder. We need to try something else. And so we did keep trying and her foster did end up adopting her. And nowadays she's a very sweet rabbit. Like she still has boundaries where she's like, I don't want to be picked up. You know, I don't want certain things. But you can pet her and you can interact with her and she doesn't attack people when they come in the room anymore. So that's a win. That's a win. Who knew that uh, you could have a, an attacking rabbit, but... I know, right? <laughs> but any animal was, gets aggressive, right? When they're Yeah, afraid. she was such a funny rabbit. She had like the little down floppy ears too. So oh, yeah. she was super cute and everyone would be like, I want that one. And I'd be like, are you sure? <laughs> yeah, like zero intimidation factor until uh, she starts biting your calves. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Well... 
Blaze, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. I think it's an important one because I think people will probably have very similar experiences, to, it kind of not even like the location independent. You know, people, it doesn't matter where you are, you're going to have similar reactions as far as like trying to help shelters understand the importance of, of helping reptiles. And, you know, ideally at the end of the day, we don't have animals ending up in shelters, but that's not a realistic goal. I mean, people yeah. say they love cats and dogs and they're the, they're in the shelters more than anything. So exactly. it's important to be able to help those shelters realize that they, they can actually play a really important role in helping these animals have long and healthy lives. Totally. Can you let everybody know where they can find more about you and, and, and your business? Cause I think that people might want to uh, touch base with you there. Yeah, um, you can find me on Instagram. I'm under Wild Ways Animal Training. Uh, you can also find me online. I have my own little website, which is wildwaysanimaltraining.com. And yeah, always happy to field questions if people are curious about what I do. And, and for the virtual consult uh, consulting or consultations, you don't. It's for anybody anywhere, right? It doesn't have to be yep. in Canada. Don't have to be in Canada. We can always do it virtually and just kind of figure things out through Zoom meetings or over the phone. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Well, Blaze, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. All right. That is the end of that episode. Blaze, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast and sharing your story. And as I said through the intro, I think this is one of those times where as a reptile hobby, we could probably do better at communicating with people who are external to the hobby. So people who are not herpeticulturalists themselves, for example, your local SPCA or your Humane Society, are there ways that we as a group can communicate with those people in order to, at the end of the day, help reptiles. So whether it's just giving them more information, helping them understand that it's probably less expensive than they think to help these animals and just give them the tools that would allow them to use that system that they already have established to move an animal from an unwanted situation to a wanted situation. I think that's at the end of the day what we really want. Of course, we want to diminish that as much as possible, but at the end of the day, it's going to happen and we would much rather see animals end up in homes of loving caregivers rather than just you know ending up in a freezer or being released because that at the end of the day is also going to impact our ability to work and care for these incredible animals. So Blaze, thank you so much for being on the podcast and bringing this story to, to the show and to the listeners. Listeners, if you enjoyed the podcast, make sure you share it on social media, Facebook, Instagram. That really does go a long way to help support the show. If you are looking for more information on this podcast or any other episode on the network, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. You can also join us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash animalsathome. There you can have immediate access to myself, early access to episodes. You also get to join the Discord server, which will allow you to communicate and chat with the other listeners. It's a really fun time in there. So if you do do that, it is greatly appreciated because, of course, that helps me support the show. You can also check out Custom Reptile Habitats. You'll find affiliate links in both the YouTube description and the show notes. If you make a purchase using one of those links, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And that's another way I keep the lights on in this room. I will see you guys next week.